Hello. So <clears throat> I've got a few serious questions to ask. The first one is, how many atheists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> and the answer is two. One to actually change the bulb, and the other one to videotape the job so that the fundamentalists don't say that God did it. <clears throat> The second question is, what is the atheist's favorite Christmas movie? Coincidence on 34th Street. <laughs> Andrew started working for the FFRF in 2011 as a constitutional consultant. Yeah, so it is his 10th anniversary this year. Um, he now holds the distinct title of the FFRF Str uh, Director of Strategic Response. He graduated uh, with a, a Bachelor of Science uh, in Neuroscience and graduated mag magna cum laude from Tulane University. For those of you keeping score, that's in New Orleans. Um, he completed a Master of Law at Denver University Sturm College of Law, and he received the outstanding LLM award. He spent a semester at C, and he studied human rights and international law at the University of Amsterdam. He's also worked uh, as a Grand Canyon tour guide where he took advantage of his foot photography skills. Um, on behalf of FFRF, he's appeared on outlets such as the MSNBC programs and even, you might have heard of this, Fox News, and regularly writes for regu uh, religion dispatches. His first book is entitled, The Founding Myth, Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American, and he's hard at work on his second book. Uh, the preface is by a man named Dan Barker, you might have heard of him, and the foreword is by uh, famed author Susan Jacoby. Legal scholar Erwin Chemerinsky uh, calls The Founding Myth beautifully written and Publishers Weekly said that Andrew provides a fervent takedown of Christian nationalism in his furious debut. Now the book is sold out, but is coming out in paperback in December, but we're delighted that FFRF has secured a couple hundred copies uh, in advance. So if you haven't had Andrew sign your book at noon, uh, he's going to be signing again, I think, at the 1.45 break this afternoon. Um, he will also be participating in the Ask Attorney workshop, which is on uh, tomorrow afternoon. I can't wait now to hear Andrew's expose on the role that Christian nationalism has played in the January 6th insurrection in a sneak preview and a major report soon to be out by FFRF and the Baptist Joint Committee. So please welcome to the stage now, author, FFRF attorney, and my good friend, Andrew Seidel. <clears throat> I disagree with that joke because the, cor the correct answer is die hard. <laughs> so before we begin, just a touch of housekeeping. This workshop is going to be me talking and then you getting to ask questions afterwards. That's our workshop for today. But I'm going to leave plenty of time for Q&A. So why Christian nationalism is un-American is the subtitle of my book. It's not often that you choose a subtitle and then the subject runs out to prove you right. <laughs> but 10 and a half months ago, Christian nationalists attacked American democracy. They attempted to overturn the results of a free and fair election and they proved beyond all doubt that Christian nationalism truly is un-American. For those of you who aren't familiar, Christian nationalism is the claim that America was founded as a Christian nation, that we were based on Judeo-Christian principles, and that we've strayed from that foundation, that we've gotten away from our godly roots. And they love the language of return, and they yearn for this golden past. 
and they claim to be the true heirs of the American experiment, and more importantly, the American identity. They're the true Americans, everyone else is an interloper. And for a long time, Christian nationalism was treated as a historical debate. Historians on one side and propagandists and politicians on the other side. But on January 6th, Christian nationalism ripped off its mask, showing that it's not a scholarly debate about how America was founded, but a violent exclusionary movement bent on seizing power in the here and now. And the insurrection really launched this conversation that some of us, Anthea Butler, Andrew Whitehead, Sam Perry, Catherine Stewart, Robbie Jones, Chrissy Stroop, Sarah Posner, Michelle Goldberg, Jack Jenkins, Jeff Charlotte, and many others, we'd kind of been having this conversation on the margins, and it sort of launched that conversation into the mainstream. And since January 6th, I have been scouring the photos and the videos and the court transcripts of what happened that day. And just dipping your toe into this world is, is truly alarming, but I have immersed myself in it. And I am more convinced now than ever before about the role that Christian nationalism played in assaulting our democracy. And that research and submersion wasn't just for the new epilogue of the founding myth, but for a huge project that, that Todd just mentioned that you're gonna see released as we get closer to the anniversary. So stay tuned for that. I'm sure many of you, like me, watched in horror live as that assault unfolded. But I wanna remind you of just some, just some of the Christian nationalism from that day. So Paula White began the rally with a prayer. And in true Christian nationalist fashion, she added the United States of America to the Lord's Prayer that is written out in Matthew 6. So she added America to a prayer that according to the Bible, Jesus himself wrote. And in that same, in that same chapter, Jesus also tells people to pray in private, not in public like the hypocrites, that can be seen to be praying by others. It's weird that Christian nationalists always ignore that biblical command. That rally ended, the rally that began with a prayer ended with Trump calling on his mob to march to the Capitol. His last words were the same that Nixon used to distract the country from Watergate. God bless you and God bless America. And if you've read the founding myth, you know all about the history of that phrase and how it was added to the end of presidential addresses very recently. Impromptu worship concerts broke out on the short walk. This is just one. I saw several, including what I'm pretty sure was a church choir, which I'm not gonna show. But here you have people wearing Trump flags and capes and red, red MAGA hats swaying and singing. Uh, and if I wanted to punish you for attending, I would make you listen to the song that is playing here, which is called the Revelation song, which begins, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. On their march to the Capitol, the Proud Boys were hailed as God's warriors, and they knelt in prayer, full of typical Christian nationalist rhetoric about restoring the nation. They marched, and then they attacked. One attacker carried a Christian flag onto the floor of the U.S. Senate. Talk about marking your territory. The absurdly self-proclaimed QAnon shaman led a prayer in the Senate about patriotism, Jesus restoring the nation, and ended that prayer in Jesus' name. One of the praying insurrectionists gave an interview later, and he actually talked about that prayer. He referenced it, and he said, we consecrated it to Jesus. He meant the Senate. We consecrated it to Jesus. That, to me, is the ultimate statement of where we are in this movement. It is. A third praying insurrectionist posted a video saying, I just wanted to get inside the building so I could plead the blood of Jesus over it. That was my goal. That's him right there. He spends 40 minutes recounting every act, most of it pleading the blood. And he attributes every action to this dialogue that he had with Jesus during the attack. And he recounts the dialogue. God told him to do it. He also said that when he was gonna to go to prison for his crimes, that he was gonna start a prison ministry. 
Another insurrectionist sipping a post-assault beer told her social media followers why she attacked the beating heart of American democracy. Let's take a listen. So to me, God and country are tied. To me, they're one and the same. We were founded as a Christian country. And we see how far we have come from that when they make an absolute mockery of us and pray to some heathen God and say, amen and a woman. What the fuck is that? We are a godly country. We are founded on godly principles. To me, God and country are tied. We were founded as a Christian nation. We are a godly country and we were founded on godly principles. The idea that we are a Christian nation and that we have slipped from those founding principles is a central tenet of Christian nationalism. And it's the primary justification for their harmful retrogressive action, like sedition and insurrection. The imagery is infamous by now. The huge wooden cross juxtaposed with the gallows from which they wanted to hang elected officials. They actually signed the gallows as if it were a yearbook, writing, hang them high, in God we trust, God bless the USA, hang for treason, amen. The flags and signs were clear. Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president, in God we trust, Jesus saves, Jesus 2020, Bible verses, crosses. One sign simply said, I am with you, God. There were Catholic images of Jesus or Mary on banners, paintings, statues, some born atop poles over the attackers' heads. A Bible verse was seen raised above the crowd like a Napoleonic eagle as the mob surges through the entrance into the Capitol. One of the people who entered the Capitol was a Catholic priest who admitted on camera to exercising the demon Baphomet while he was in there. And tell me what kind of a minister are you? What's the name of your church? Roman Catholic, uh, from uh, oh, Catholic Nebraska. Priest. And so, um, uh, got this going, got these exorcism prayers going. I uh, was priest using them. Right. Were you, did you do an exorcism at the Capitol? Yes, I did. What was that like? Um, we'll see. Did you see, see did, 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 were you able to feel the effect of the exorcism? Not with our eyes, no. And what, what, what has possessed the capital? Um, there's a demon called um, Bohemian, and uh, exorcists have uh, found out that um, he's the one who is um, dissolving the country in order to um, bring it into something different. There's a demon Baphomet that was exorcised from the capital. Did you happen to notice the flag over his shoulder? Proud American Christian with the Jesus fish. Another attacker was a youth pastor from Florida. Others were missionaries. They sang the battle hymn of the Republic in the rotunda. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. They prayed in the rotunda. One group, the Jericho March, was founded by two federal workers who were sent visions from God to, quote, let the church roar. The Battle of Jericho was a genocide. In the story, the biblical God orders his followers to march around the city blowing shofars, ram's horns, and carrying the ark holding his commandments. And then they violently sack the city, steal all the valuables, and murder every living thing in there, including the animals. So the Jericho march baptized itself after a biblical genocide, and then reenacted that slaughter by blowing shofars, marching around government buildings in D.C. and in state capitals, declaring that this is one nation under God, and organizing rallies alongside the Stop the Steal charlatans. And it wasn't just imagery and rhetoric. It was a devout belief that this is a Christian nation and that God chose Donald Trump. And Trump himself said so. I am the chosen one. Do you remember that? I am the chosen one. The attacker who kicked in Speaker Pelosi's door, hoping to, quote, tear her into little pieces, was an attorney. His rantings were recounted at one of his hearings after he was charged. He said, God is on Trump's side. God is not on the Democrats' side. And if patriots have to kill 60 million of these communists, it is God's will. 
There were, of course, other motivations and drivers of the attack. But this Christian nationalist permission structure, doing God's will, fighting for God's law, returning the country to its Christian roots, it pervaded all the other obvious drivers of the attack. For instance, the insurrection had a distinct QAnon flavor. But study after study is exposing the link between QAnon and Christian nationalism and QAnon and or white evangelicalism. And that's actually why I chose this particular photo. This is white MAGA Jesus. It may be the most representative symbol of the day. Uh, it's Peter V. Bianchi's original portrait, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's a very popular American depiction of Jesus though first century residents of the Levant did not look like that white man. Jesus, if he existed, was definitely not white. And nor did he wear a MAGA hat. Uh, but they, they photoshopped in the MAGA hat, and then they also photoshopped onto JC's white robes. That is the QAnon motto, WWG1WGA, where we go one, we go all. So it's Q and whiteness wrapped up in Christian nationalism. And this was a largely white crowd. The Black Lives Matter protesters in DC neither received nor expected such leniency that summer, as this New York Times video shows. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. Trump warned about that in May 2020, quoting a phrase that's got a very long and racist history. So Trump had these peaceful protesters gassed and beaten and brutalized with rubber bullets so that he could walk to a church and pose with a Bible for a photo op. And the point of that malignant stroll was to show that we are a Bible-believing, Bible-beating Christian nation, and anyone who disagrees with that deserves to be beaten and gassed. And that scene harkens back to some of America's most shameful histories. So to speak of Christian nationalism is to speak of white Christian nationalism. So this privileged mob roamed the halls without fear, brazenly entitled. Perhaps they mistakenly believed that Trump would pardon them, but they certainly believed that this is their country given to them by their God and that they are acting on his orders and defending his chosen one. And when reality collides with a belief system like that, violence is almost inevitable entitlement and violence, and all of it based on disinformation. Christian nationalism is an entire identity based on disinformation. It's not a scholarly debate about our history. It is a sinister exclusionary movement. It is an attempt to redefine America according to the Christian nationalist identity and disinformation, and then to reshape our law accordingly. And you've heard the disinformation before many, many times. We're one nation under God, in God we trust. The Declaration of Independence references the Christian God four different times. The Founding Fathers prayed during the Constitutional Convention. George Washington knelt in the snow at Valley Forge in prayer. Our laws are based on the Golden Rule. Our laws are based on the Ten Commandments. None of that's true. And without their origin myths, their identity withers. Their entire political and ideological reality is incredibly weak and vulnerable because it's based on disinformation. It also becomes clear when you explore the myth and lies that this truly is an un-American political ideology. It's not just that the identity is based on disinformation. It's bigger. It's that Judeo-Christian principles, and especially those principles that are central to the Christian nationalist identity are thoroughly opposed to the principles on which the United States was built. The two systems differ and conflict in fundamental in, and irreconcilable ways. We can beat Christian nationalism. We can relegate it back to the fringe whence it came by exposing the disinformation that feeds that identity. Now, we can't convince all Christian nationalists to change but we can alert most of the country to the danger and prevent our government from giving aid and comfort to that un-American identity that assaulted our democracy. Again, the entire identity is based on lies and myths, but it's validated by modern representations of those myths that previous Christian nationalists 
have imposed on the country during crises. The erroneous beliefs are validated when they see in God we trust on our money or on a government building, or when they're told as school children that we are one nation under God, or when Congress opens with prayers that assure every Christian nationalist that this is indeed his America. The Ten Commandments monuments that sit on government property proclaiming, I am the Lord thy God. The Christian nationalist identity draws legitimacy from these artifacts left by previous waves of Christian nationalists. These relics are disfiguring scars. They ought to remind us that Christian nationalists have justified slavery, sanctified segregation, and now inspired an insurrection. Instead, the scars reinforce that un-American identity. And until we erase those scars, we are giving aid and comfort to a traitor, to this un-American philosophy. America is a shared idea, and Christian nationalism refuses to share. It excludes non-Christians and the wrong kind of Christians. America will never be a Christian nation, because the moment it becomes a Christian nation, it will cease to be America. The two cannot peacefully coexist. One will triumph, and that is the choice that we face as a nation, Christian nationalism or America because we can't have both. Thank you. So I am gonna take questions. James is setting up a microphone in the middle there and will help people with that. Okay, he will not, he's just, it's right there. Um, and let me add, um, there's a lot more information on Christian nationalism and the lead up to the January 6th insurrection in the paperback uh, of the founding myth. And again, it's not on sale anywhere else. The only place you can get it right now is here at the FFRF convention. Uh, it doesn't go on sale till mid-December. So this is an FFRF exclusive right now. Uh, and I'm also donating all the, well, most of the royalties from the sales back to FFRF, uh, from all the sales through FFRF. Um, <laughs> And I'm happy to sign those. Signed books make a fantastic gift, and tis the season for the war on Christmas. Um, also, Dan and Annie Laurie. Annie Laurie is just telling me before my talk that I have to carry all the books home on my back, uphill both ways if we don't sell out. So please help me. Um, OK, questions. We have one person coming up. Uh, yes. One thing I noticed, I watched the insurrection live. We were close to Washington, D.C., and I watched it a lot. And I saw those, all that Christian symbolism that you showed, mm -hmm. and yet in every rebroadcast, they're gone. And I, I just am so concerned about the sanitizing of the uh, insurrection to remove all that. What, what uh, do you have any comments on that? Yes, uh, for those of you who didn't hear, there's concern about the sanitizing of the Christian nationalism from the insurrection in our, in our history and in the replays that you're seeing. And FFRF is working with Baptist Joint Committee on a big report that will not let that happen. Um, as stick around, I mean, that's gonna be right near the anniversary that that will be coming out. Oh, you can also, I mean, it's also in the book too. <laughs> Thanks so much for inspiring presentation. Uh, so my question is, in the days and weeks after uh, January 6th attack, my co-workers and even close personal friends contended that the participants of the events were within their rights afforded by the First Amendment. And therefore, if I claim those rights for myself, I have to afford those rights to them. And um, I was at a loss how to respond. So I'm wondering if you can help to frame a response yeah, I mean, in objective terms. Sure, sure. I mean, the, the, the long and short of it is the First Amendment is not a right to riot and attack the government, right? It's, it's not a right to violently attempt to overthrow. They weren't protesting when they were on the floor of the Senate rifling through desks, taking pictures of senators' papers when they were breaking down the doors. Uh, when they were trying to get 
to the members of Congress who were evacuating at the time. I mean, the, the Ashley Babbitt shooting happened because they were trying to get to the area where members of Congress were being evacuated uh, by the protection squads. So, it, it, I mean, it, to me, it's very clearly not a protected First Amendment exercise. I mean, they did that at the beginning, at the rally, um, but beyond that, absolutely not. Thanks. Sure. Hi. Hi, Andrew. So, um, I don't know if anybody else has gotten the notification, but Kyle Rittenhouse just got off on all his charges for murder. And uh, I'm just wondering, um, how do you see Christian nationalism playing into sentencing, um, not just for the January 6th um, P players, like we just saw the shaman get only three years for his playing, which to me seems like a huge, you know, low bar for what he is, his play was in there, but for, for just in general, um, you know, him, Kyle Rittenhouse, basically getting away with murder, but how do you see Christian nationalism basically playing away in some of these, you know, the riots and, and things going on in the world right now, and the courts? Yeah, well, you know, one of the people I talked to in writing the report was the videographer who shot that New Yorker video that everybody saw. He's the one who actually captured the prayer um, in the Senate. Uh, and when I was, I was talking to him on the phone, he's, he's actually a war videographer. I mean, a war photographer, that's what he does. And he was there in DC during this. And he was saying, you know, I had no idea about the Christian nationalism in this, you know, I knew about QAnon, I knew about the white supremacy, I knew about the militia groups, but he said, I didn't realize that Christian nationalism was the thing that tied it all together until I was there that day on the floor of the Senate. And I mean, to, I mean, to me, that really is, you cannot understand what is happening in this country without understanding Christian nationalism. It, it really is the, the thread, the undercurrent that ties all of these seemingly disparate parts of this, this movement together. Uh, and the overarching ideology. I mean, to, to tie it closer to the Rittenhouse, uh, it, the, there was a website called Give, Send, Go, which is a Christian fundraising website that is where Kyle Rittenhouse raised all the funds for his defense. And you can, I mean, I wrote about this uh, as one of the op-eds that we published earlier this year. Uh, you know, the, the money he raised was on a Christian fundraising website. They were pretty clear about it. So, I mean, to me, it, it really is, uh, it, you just cannot understand what is happening in the country right now without understanding Christian nationalism. It seems after the insurrection, now that, uh, well, there's been 300 some odd arrests, I guess, that uh, these people are being treated with a unusual level of leniency in the courts and by law enforcement. Is this a legal tactic to nail them harder after collecting more evidence, or is this a Christian government giving Christian nationalists a free pass? And my second question, are you gonna be pitching your book on Rachel or Mar? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if Rachel wants to have me on to pitch my book, I'd love to do that. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know how lenient what we're seeing is. Um, I, I think a lot of people are getting, paying more more attention to our criminal justice system than they have ever before. Um, would I like to see more for some of this? Yeah. But I, th I think, by and large, we've done a pretty good job. And I think the Department of Justice and the FBI in particular has done a pretty reasonable job with everything that's been happening. I mean, it, it was a, and actually, the, there's a group of citizens out there who are doing a lot of the investigation work and identifying people that are just absolutely phenomenal. We have not identified the guy who carried the Christian flag onto the floor of the US Senate yet. He still remains at large and unidentified. Um, there's something like 600 plus um, cases going on right now. Uh, so it, it's, it's a huge task um, and, and there's a lot of work to be done. But I'm, I'm not unhappy with, with the way things have been going at all. I don't, I don't think it's been particularly lenient one way or another. How do you think the Supreme Court is going to rule on the Boston Christian flag case? Uh, we'll talk about that one in the Ask an Attorney. Oh, later on the day. I have, I have very little faith in our Supreme Court at the moment. Right. Okay. We'll listen to that later. It's also the, top, yeah, the, next book that I, the next book I'm writing is about the Supreme Court in large part. They are the villain. 
Okay, so first, thank you for the founding myth. I've shared uh, that, the insights from that book with one of my book clubs, and everybody was astonished, and they, were, they felt they had been enlightened, so I thank you for that. But then, well, thank you. <laughs> but then, um, do you have any practical suggestions or approaches for those times when we do interface with Trumpers, evangelicals, in terms of how to perhaps make a dent or, or in any way help them to question their own beliefs? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's probably the most common question I get asked, um, is, is how can we actually help change some of these people's minds? Yeah. And some people's minds you're not going to change, right? We should be honest about that. But I think it is certainly possible. And a lot of people in this room, for instance, change their mind about one of the biggest questions out there. Um, Right? I mean, how many people in here were believers that are now atheists? Yeah. There's, I mean, this is a good job. We can change our minds about really important issues that seem to explain everything. So it's certainly possible. Uh, and the number one thing is, I mean, this is not really revelatory advice, is, is active listening and asking questions about and letting them see how they are wrong versus telling them how they are wrong. Um, and, and I will say, this is also an expectations game. When you go into these conversations, you should not expect to change somebody's mind right away because you're just destined to be disappointed in that case. What you should expect to do is plant a seed that allows them to then change their mind on their own later on. You're not going to change somebody's mind for them. They're gonna do it themselves. Uh, but I mean, having that information in the founding myth and bring, everybody should get a copy and take it to their book clubs. Um, I mean, it, it, like, Having that information at your fingertips and knowing it is supremely helpful to be able to correct that disinformation and say, actually, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fairly certain that's not true and this is what happened. You know, why do you think otherwise? Um, so, I mean, it's, again, active listening is, is the key. Thank you. I think she cut my question very short. Okay. I, um, I wanted to make a, just a suggestion. I think what we often do is a passive communication. We think you know, active listening and, um, you know, giving people time, you're not gonna change people's mind, which is true, we're not going to change it. However, these Christian organizations, political organizations, they use what we call psychological warfare. Oh yeah. They have a psychologist, marketing psychologist, they have a, all type of resources that can go to the brain of your child, of your neighbor's child, it might be time for us to think almost the same way, to come up with some more active strategy to plant some sort of different seeds. Or if we sit there passively, we're going to see the America you just described, which is no longer going to be the America we dream of, but it's going to be the Christian nation, which then be, uh, you know, America is gone. Yeah, it's our nightmare. I mean, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I mean, the infrastructure that we are up against is, I mean, just immense. Uh, Catherine Stewart's book, The Power Worshippers, is back there on the table. If you haven't read that, get a copy of that. She does a great job of explaining the structure and the just web of and the network that we are up against i mean it is immense um and we we are severely outgunned which is why we appreciate everybody in here supporting ffrf yes sir is a video recording of this going to be made available because there are a lot of people i know that i would like to send a link to that video it will too. be bruce is going to make my video portions better and he'll probably cut off the q a and then he'll publish it for but it'll be out at some point yeah very good thank sure, you sure sure And somebody will tell me when, Annie Laurie, when we're, I have, I have a timer down here, but, okay, go ahead. Speaking of the leniency that some of these people have been, we've discussed, is it possible that they've been getting it? Because I'm trying to say this in a nice way, but particularly Mr. QAnon Sherman, some of these people are not too tightly wrapped. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that some of these people are victims, for uh -huh. sure. I mean, yes. they are they are victim victims of disinformation. The they they are victims of disinformation. We just talked about the mm -hmm. network that is arrayed against them, mm -hmm. and it, it takes a lot to stand up and against that onslaught mentally. Mm 
Um, and, and I, I mean, so I think some of them are, and I mean, it's hard, it's, it's hard to keep that in mind, especially doing the work that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do think a lot of the, I mean, a lot of these people have been duped into mm -hmm. believing nonsense um, and, and to the point where they're willing to try to attack and subvert a free and fair election in the name of the country that is doing the electing. I mean, it, it, it is, it, it does seem kind of crazy in a way, but I, again, I think I, when, I, when I go down that mental rabbit hole, mm -hmm. I try to remind myself that a lot of these people are, are victims as well, and they really are up against this, just this onslaught. Uh -huh. And when you're having an argument, I found this okay. out, when you're having an argument with okay. somebody I have to do one more question, I'm sorry. sorry. We can chat more later. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And I'm here all weekend, so I'm happy to chat with people. So one last question. Lauren? Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, so I don't know about the rest of you, but I get a lot of my news from FFRF's podcast. Um, but I was just wondering, Andrew, like, what are some of your favorite, uh, personally, news sources that are unbiased, especially ones uh, you know, from a legal standpoint to keep up with the news? Yeah, I mean, everything FFRF. Annie Laurie and I write a lot of it <laughs> together. Um, outside of FFRF, I, I listen to a lot of NPR. Um, in terms of legal coverage, I really like Slate's legal coverage. I really love Linda Greenhouse's op-eds. Uh, they're fantastic. She's a guiding light. Um, I, think she, I, think she's, she's, I think she's I think she's. I was sitting right room. next to her, yeah. So there you go, yeah, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, I, I do, I also watch a lot of PBS NewsHour. That's like where I get most of my, my news, but yeah, I mean, those are kind of some of the big ones for me. I have to put together a list, maybe. But yeah, that'd be awesome. That's a... okay. what about? Oh, for pleasure. Uh, I mean, I, I read a ton of books. Okay. I'm, yeah, mostly just reading tons of books these days and writing as well. So, awesome. yeah, and you can find me at the bar and buy me a drink, and I'll talk more about specifics. On awesome. All right. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.